Hey there, welcome to part two of Cambridge Inside Out. My name is Robert Winters. Uh, my name is Will Durbin. Will Durbin, and Will Durbin is a famous man these last few weeks. Uh, just uh, since the passage of this recent um, city council meeting, I guess. Right, so, um, so, city, so Will is actually the uh, legislative aide for Councillor Craig Kelly and uh, has actually done sort of a rather significant amount of work in drafting, putting together the regulation that was recently passed having to do with short-term rentals. Yeah, I should mention that um, I've been in Councillor Craig Kelly's office since um, June 2015, so I'm now going into my third year. We've been working on this since um, June 2016, so with the passage, this was over, what, 18 months worth of work? Kicked yeah. off, like I said, in June 2016, and we finally brought it to a close uh, just earlier this month. Pretty good. Yeah. Should we dig in? Let's dig in. By, by the way, um, I think it's appropriate to say I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller, and, <laughs> and, I, and I am curious if I answer all your questions correctly. Do I win like a million dollars at the end? Or is uh, this... Yes, but it's all in Monopoly money. <laughs> all right. Well, that's a good okay. enough. That's the advantage I need. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so basically, what's, what was the sort of the lay of the land? How do we get from then, from the... What, what, where, did, where did the idea originate to actually do this? Was this something that was sort of thrust upon us? Sure. Or we seek it out? No, this was um, actually brought to our attention in spring of 2016. We began to see a lot of complaints from residents, uh, mostly about the impact that short-term rentals, uh, Airbnb, uh, VRBIO, uh, home away we're having on their neighborhoods. People are coming in late at night to their neighborhoods, knocking on doors errantly, thinking that um, that they were knocking on their host door. A right. lack of parking, parking spaces for guests being used, you know, commercially as short-term rental um, guests were coming into the neighborhood. And so that's really what peaked it off for us. And um, when we started digging, then we found a lot more um, that other cities worked, that other cities had done that led us to be more concerned about broader implications of short-term rental. Um, practices in the city in the absence of regulations. And uh, so, so once the realization was there, was it was in, it was just a matter of sort of sort of making something up, or was this a research project? How did we actually? Well, the fire turned up quite quickly, actually, because WGBH did a piece, um, I believe, that same June in Cambridge, a Airbnb backlash, which really set us off against the wrong tone. Um, we really wanted, and there was a lot of uh, friction up at the state house as well. Right. right, we'll get to that. I think what's happening in the state house, what has been happening at the state house, um, has been a very interesting process to watch, and hopefully that too will be coming to a close pretty shortly. Um, but after we started digging into it, we looked at other cities, places like New York City, which had been uh, having a long problem with trying to grapple with their short-term rental um, presence, and then putting policies in in uh, place. They had to subpoena. Um, Airbnb to try and get information, you know, on the progressive policy that the best policies um, need good data. Uh, they were re requesting some of that information. Airbnb was withholding some of it. It was found out later that they were ditching some of their participants in order to clean up their data. And, um, and so anyways, we were looking at New York City. We were looking at Vancouver and Seattle, um, Berlin and Barcelona all to see what they were trying to do. That's Berlin, Maine, right? Berlin, no. <laughs> Berlin, uh, Germany, uh, which has some of the more strict... Well, That's right. It is a very much a worldwide phenomenon. Right. Yes. Well, it, it, not only in terms of the footprint of Airbnb, but as far as um, the people that they attract to Cambridge. Uh, this is, as Airbnb has global popularity, not, like I said, just among hosts, but among tourists as well. Um, so in addition to looking at the number of uh, different cities that were uh, operating and trying to take a grasp on this issue. We started looking at a lot of uh, reports from the implications and the impact that short-term rentals were having on the, on the long-term rental market and found mm -hmm. problems like gentrification. Uh, there was a study out of, um, actually here at the Harvard Law Review, Dane Lee just graduated last year. He published a paper um, about Los Angeles and the impact there, suggesting that uh, short-term rentals were increasing the rate of gentrification cutting down on the availability of housing stock generally, cutting down on the availability of affordable housing, and then tweaking rental prices. And actually, there was a study that was published by the University of Massachusetts um, that I just got a hold of last month. I think it was under embargo for, a re for some reason or other. But anyways, it suggested that there was a, a measurable um, impact that short-term rentals had on Boston's um, rental prices of 
in 2015, they measured it to be $79 increase because of short-term rental activity. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they estimated that in 2018 and 19, it would be as much as $170 per rental unit. Um, and so they were really measuring the impact. And of course, Boston, right across the river, um, has a lot of the same practices, even a lot of the same participants uh, that were operating here in Cambridge. Well, before getting into some of the details, what we actually uh, ordained recently, um, there's another factor which uh, I never thought of until relatively recently, which is that when I saw the hearing stories of people actually purchasing homes under either under the expectation that they would be able to uh, do an Airbnb with a piece of it or whatever, so that it actually has had a bit of a ripple effect on housing prices as well. I don't know that I've seen it very well quantified yet, but I certainly hear the stories. Well, that piece out of UMass Boston, uh, I forget the name of the author, but it's through, it was his um, economics master's pro project. Uh, it's a good start. Um, but, but yes, you not only have people that were buying up short-term rentals uh, for the, per or sorry, buying up housing stock for the purpose of turning them into short-term rentals, but renters, uh, renting more than that, what they were capable of occupying um, for the sole purpose of renting out the two, uh, the second or right. third bedroom in their apartment. And there is a growing tend in some other cities of landlords working directly with uh, renters um, to place them in a um, apartment to sort of get around like the ordinance that we passed. Right, it's like straw man. Exactly. They right. put someone in there that's so really I'll a manager. Put, I'll put you in, uh, you pretend you sort of formally become the, the tenant and then I'll give my approval to you to do this. Right. right. So and it's really working. There was an uh, article, I forget it was in the Wall Street Journal or the business, uh, another business journal, but mentioned that this was now a new strategy that Airbnb was employing in cities was to go directly to real estate markets and work directly with landlords. All right. So uh, now from the inception, which was last summer, uh, until relatively recently, I know there, there were, I, I went to a few of the ordinance committee, actually before originally it was public safety committee, there was housing committee, eventually ordinance committee. This got, this has been fully processed. Well, not, uh, not even as formal as that. We had several <laughs> public meetings with uh, neighborhoods and various different neighbors uh, groups and met them with uh, neighborhood organizations. And I can't tell you how many calls we've received and emails coming in. Uh, but yes, we had several public safety meetings. We had joint public safety and housing meetings with Vice Mayor McGovern, and then we kicked it off into ordinance committee hearings. And that went through, I think, three different iterations uh, before we went to city council meetings. And we did have several discussions in city council. So yes, this has, has been a very long, drawn out debate. <laughs> fully processed. Yeah, fully processed. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting is because I, you know, I think maybe I was sort of aware that a little bit of that kind of activity was happening around my neighborhood. but. You actually did some uh, quantification of this, maybe got some Airbnb numbers, some other numbers to actually give some estimates of how many different dwelling units around the city actually were involved in doing Airbnb either regularly or, or at one time. Right. Do you have some quantity? Quanti well, unfortunately, I had the slides that were- We were gonna have slides, slides, but the computer's not working. Illustrate this perfectly, so a lot of this would have to be from memory. Um, we went from a very short amount of time from having 700 short-term rentals in 2013 to just two years later, um, tripling that amount, um, as much as 1,800, and now we have about 2,000 uh, in the city, and that's the majority of that is, is Airbnb, and this actually puts us at a density higher than Boston, which has, um, although they have more short-term rentals and Airbnbs um, overall throughout the city, there's a lot more square footage in Boston for them to spread right. out, and so per acre, uh, Cambridge has some of the higher densities, and so you have areas like um, Central Square, Harvard Square, and especially down in, in uh, Kendall Square, the watermark in particular, um, has just been a hotbed for a short-term rental activity. Um, and actually these, this concentration um, in certain neighborhoods around public amenities and public transportation or tourist hotspots actually accentuates all this problem I was talking right. about. And so it, it, you know, gentrification is, is, is further um, accelerated in those areas versus Strawberry Hill, for example, that has very little. Yeah, um, I think, uh, I, I don't know about other people, but I know for me, when I saw some of the numbers, uh, which actually wasn't, that was, was that as way back as last summer when there were hearings even on that? As far as the numbers? Yeah, but I think I went to something, but, but anyway, it was either that or last fall. I actually, you know, I was quite surprised to hear, hear about that. I think somebody actually did a comparison and said the number of affordable units the city is actually in, in, 
had constructed is sort of on par with the number of Airbnbs? Well, I think uh, what I was looking at is the, the growth that Airbnb had enjoyed in the past couple of years um, is far out, um, outmatched what uh, the city was replacing in affordable housing. Right. Uh, and, and unfortunately, like I said, I had the information up. Um, but what you also saw, too, was a number of uh, properties being owned by the same operator. Um, right. I think it was, I think the top operator had as many as 13 different properties here and the top this yeah the top 10 operators in Cambridge own properties around the state and even around uh, New England and down into to um, in New York City so there was something like the top 10 uh, operators had a thousand Airbnbs spread out over you know multiple states now we actually we have provision we had provisions in the law and still do for things like hotels we have a provisions in the law for um, sing, single uh, uh, SROs, single single room occupancies, right? Rooming houses, but the Airbnb phenomenon sort of didn't fit into any of those categories, so it, it was unregulated, right? But it was proliferating like mad. And, and and this is actually a process that some um, researchers have done, dubbed regulatory entrepreneurship, where you uh, you put a business and, and a policy ahead of what regulations knowingly right. with the thought that once you saturate the market enough, uh, regulators will have no choice but to um, acquiesce to what the business uh, operations that you're already currently uh, doing, you know, they have to, to catch up regulatory. Sure. And so again, this process we've seen in a number of different states and cities across, um, across New, uh, North America really, and the globe. Um, mm. Now, we did pass something on August, set, ordained uh, unanimously on August 7, but there were certain iterations that led up to that, right? Right up into August 7th when there were some proposals for some changes to this. So, um, so the final product is not exactly the same as every little iteration that went along here, but it seemed like it did sort of stabilize, uh, you know, a month or so ago, and then more or less got passed with a few mild provisions right. from what, where it had you know, kind of found its place, right? right. I, I think this idea of the owner adjacent um, or the operator, sorry, owner adjacent plus operator occupied, we had put out since September of last year. So this is now more than, you know, almost, um, I think at the time when we had petition was out, it had been uh, six months of being in the public sphere. And then the petition itself was in this public sphere since, I want to say April. Um, so lots of time for review, and we did receive a lot of reviews. And you're right, there were several iterations uh, and several amendments that were put forward both before it was a formal petition and afterwards. I think one of the more crucial ones is we originally were looking at um, expanding our definition of owner adjacent to be the, the building next door. And there was, um, and I, there was sort of an argument counter to that that said it's going to be hard to enforce, and it's kind of hard to define what adjacency is. If you're across the street, if you're a kitty corner to a property, well, what happens if you're on a corner? Right. You know, and these are some of the questions that um, are very um, shrewd and astute residents that were following this issue brought to our right. attention. Um, and by the way, I have to give credit out. Maybe at the end I can give some shout outs to city staff that were helping us along with this process. Sure. But um, I, I'm not from Cambridge, I'm from Ohio, and um, I've been, been consistently impressed with the city citizen engagement throughout this entire process, the going through the whole petition with a hairline comb, and um, you know vetting out different iterations with it, it's been incredible. Right, and now in the end, so we ended up <laughs> with a with an ordinance. Now, why don't you hit hit on the sort of the, the key points of the ordinance, sir? Right. So first off, what constitutes short term rental? So short term rental to... is anything that's less than thirty days. Um, it has to be in a residential. Um, a building used for residential uses, and it has to be you know rented out. This isn't something that, for example, um, there's some iterations where there's um, professional managed groups that it's like more than five days, or um, you know there's a manager on site. We did very simply just categorize as anything less than than thirty days. Seems good. Yeah. Yeah. And simple is good. And, and this is actually on par with what other cities are doing, and, and it's consistent with um, language that's in our own zoning amendment. And so the, the big, if I can jump ahead, the big difference that we've created, um, the two categories um, for short-term rentals, and these are the only opportunities that a Cambridge resident would have to offer a short-term rental. One is if it is an operator occupied, meaning if you live in your apartment you can, and you have two bedrooms or three bedrooms, you can offer one of those uh, separate bedrooms out for short-term rental. Um, if you own 
Three. So this is really good for the people whose kids have grown up and right. still have a family exactly. house. Exactly. So whether or not it's a one-family house or you know up to three-family, four-family, if you have extra bedrooms, you can now begin renting those out uh, legally through short-term rentals if you mm -hmm. have registration and inspection. The other category that we've created, and there was a little bit of um, controversy about whether or not we should include them, um, but the other category we've created is owner-adjacent, meaning if you own that three-family house, and you live in one of the three residential dwellings, uh, you can offer one of those other dwellings for short-term rental as a whole unit only. Um, you can also offer your own apartment, but that third bedroom, so now let's say, like I said, in this instance where there's three, one you can occupy and you can, and you can rent out short-term. Uh, another unit you can rent out as an owner adjacent, that third has to go on the long-term market. Right. And that applies for three and, f and four families and then on up uh, for that. And in fact, uh, owner adjacents are not permitted in any uh, dwelling that is above four units. Now, I'm assuming that if you had a triple decker, right. you know, like with a single entry, then this means you have to actually change the hardware, right? Because if you're going to be doing a turnover, we have different people coming, you know, on different days and whatever, just giving, issuing the key, right, doesn't necessarily work so much because, you know, the person who's the long term tenant feels they want to have some security and so I, you know I, I imagine there's going to have to be some things worked out here. Well I, I, the operators have been doing a lot of that already. Um, I've we, seen these things with like combination exactly. codes. And, and, and those combination codes can be set um, um, remotely. You can set yes. the combination and just send a text to the person coming up. But um, I mean really what we've we're hoping to uh, you know avoid a lot of that type of activity altogether. I'm mean, certainly I'm sure that some owners will opt into that, but the owner has to live on premises. Right. And so the idea is, you know, when I gave you the example of the people wandering throughout the night, they're there to answer the phone, they're there to open the door, help with parking if need be, um, and not disturb both their neighbors on either side or across the street, but also this long-term renter that's been, you know, that they've offered a, a lease to, um, they should not have to um, unduly bear the brunt of their commercial activity in this office in their house as well. So we're hoping to cut down on that activity as well, or at least some of the disruption. Right. Now, now as this rolls out, and I think the, um, the inspections and things can start, what, October, but the effective date is next April 1st? Right. Right. So and now, I, though I imagine you know, people who are already do Airbnbs somewhat illicitly now will probably continue to do it, but everything kind of gets straightened out in theory come April 1st of next year. So the... Um, Commissioner of Inspectional Services will begin, um, well, hopefully they hope to begin uh, issuing some permits in October. Um, they might do it so earlier if they have the capacity to do so with the inspections. I think there's also an idea that they'll be hiring no, new people uh, mm -hmm. to help with enforcement. Um, but it really comes down, I think, to, um, well, it comes down, I, I lost my train of thought actually, but. So then you, this is the queue you're supposed to... <laughs> <laughs> well, basically I was concerned about the, the rollout of this because, you know, if there's already hundreds of units uh, um, that are already operating in this way here, right. somehow I can't imagine that they were all just going to like stop cold, kick everybody out and wait until April 1st right. to do it legally, right? So we are kind of in this gray zone right, right now. Well, and, and this is, thank you very much, in very, uh, you know, proactive terms. Uh, voluntary enrollment begins, like I said, in October, and then come April 1st, we will begin enforcing in earnest. Um, up until that time, um, you know, people should get their ducks in a row, I, right. think is, I think is the main message. Fair to say. Now, uh, now this is a, basically, this was a zoning change that permits right. a disuse, but it's also, in addition to being a zoning change, it's sort of a, uh, a, a, I don't know if the word license is the right term, but basically you do have to get the okay from inspectional services in principle. So now here's my supposition. If, if uh, somebody was doing this badly and somehow if there were real problems and people were complaining and the, the owner was doing nothing, um, is there a means for which then the inspectional service can, can just revoke the license? Or permit. Well, we have empowered the Inspectional Services um, Commissioner to enforce um, all the regulations that we passed. And, so and, to, and to promulgate and regulations, to promulgate regulations as, well. as well. So if there are problems with the rollout, if there are problems um, you know, with sanitation, with building code, 
um, with food being offered that is, you know, without a license. Right. These type of things, the inspectional services director, I, I believe, we've empowered him to enforce uh, those type of uh, complaints and regulations. Like I said, they'll have a process to, to roll out regulations um, to help sort of prop up what we pass. But the skeleton, I think, um, yeah, the skeleton of, of the ordinance is there. Right. Now, there was one thing you know, on the night of ordination. There were a ser series of uh, amendments that were proposed, I think principally by Councilor Carlone, that were, did not, I think they died on a four to five vote. Right. Where he wanted to rescind the owner adjacent right. Uh, provision, right? So, so that, that did not prevail, so we, we, they, are, they are now permitted. But could you, again, sort of to play devil's advocate or whatever, or whatever advocate position you want here, what, was, what do you feel would have been the logic in trying to not permit those, or at least what was said? Sure. Or what was the logic in well, retaining that capacity? One of the arguments was, was put forward that um, Cambridge is the only city that has these owner-adjacent um, provisions. And that's, that's technically true, and this is one of the arguments that uh, Councillor Carlone put forward. Yeah. But uh, what I, did, I think he failed to realize is that these cities that just limit it to um, primary residence occupancy only, uh, they have uh, accessory dwellings that are accessory dwellings that are available uh, for short-term rentals. So this might be the coach house, uh, this might be the basement, and so it wasn't exact. Uh, you know, the room over the garage. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, I thought there was a little bit of apples and oranges being compared between the two city policies. Yeah. Um, but the the main idea was that if if we are really concerned about affordable housing um, with both low and moderate income, because let's let's be honest, not all. Short-term rentals were happening in places that will be available for moderate, you know, or I'm sorry, lower income. There's some mm -hmm. moderate, but to help uh, expand the availability of housing across the housing market, um, we need to fight for every housing unit we can. And um, you know, why would we allow this owner adjacent? Was the the main argument uh, to right. be offered for short-term rentals? But I think between you know they're going to be taxed, they're going to have to uh, be inspected. Uh, they can only be offered as a whole unit. Uh, which means mm -hmm. if you have those three bedrooms I was talking about in this one unit... You can't run you, it like a rooming house. You can't run it like a rooming house. In fact, the only way to, mon um, um, to profit off of each individual bedroom is if you put a long-term renter in each one of them. Right. Um, you can only sell the entire unit as a whole. And I think that was a, a big portion of this that was overlooked um, by a lot of the advocates. But yes, um, there certainly was some unexpected voting going on on the floor um, yeah, there was one other, just in the last three or so minutes we have here, there was another uh, controversy, if I saw it correctly, over whether, I think it was Council Mazin believed that um, a renter should just have the right to do Airbnb without anybody's permission at all. Right. And that, that's not how it what was passed. It was actually, you do need written, explicit written approval of a property owner. Right or the, right. Uh, or the or the, the, owner, or the con and the kind of if applicable, if right. applicable right right you know so um, but that 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 was sort of interesting to me that seemed a little bit like more of a slam dunk though because ultimately the the um, liability rests with the property owner and and it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense well I, I think it's I think it was so, Councillor Toomey who said um, I couldn't imagine passing an ordinance that would um, that would allow people to lose their homes right you know. Um, right, and potentially that could have, that could be the case. If, if, you know. Yeah, if somebody's being sued, oh, oh by the way, we're requiring short-term rental operators to uh, have um, liability insurance uh, that's right. adequate, um, adequate for covering. The state has set that if uh, the certain uh, provision that's before them now at a million dollars. But now for a homeowner, if you have a homeowner's policy, that would just be an additional rider, and I hopefully the insurance companies actually have some sort of. Uh, actuarial stuff ready to roll to it is, figure the cost. It is funny all the cottage industries that are popping up in service of short-term rentals, one being cleaning services and another being uh, monitoring, but yeah. uh, insurance is specifically for short-term rental properties is, is something that is being written uh, right now. So, um, companies are beginning to offer it, um, whereas before those didn't exist. Right, so the, you know, the world's a changing. That's right. To be sure. But, but actually, just to be clear, a tenant could do Airbnb, like for example, I think, uh, but if not if they go away, it's only if they're actually in the right place. Right. But they, but they must get the permission, explicit permission of the owner. Written permission, yeah. Is yes. that we've... Right. And, and that might have, you know, a chilling effect on the avail uh, ability of some renters to operate short-term rentals out of their apartment, but um, ultimately the landlord's on the hook. 
and um, it wasn't as simple as returning. I think Mazza made the argument, you know, as long as you return the unit in the condition which it was given to you, all is good. But of course, I mean, not to mention my lease agreement that I have right now specifically forbids um, right. any any um, uh, subtenancy. Right. So a lot of leases say yeah. that, but um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, we only got a minute left here. Um, so uh, are there any other particular features of the ordinance that has passed? Um, is there now a possibility of, of future uh, modifications down the road at all? Sure. Or well, we set in stone? I will say uh, the state is working on a legislative uh, solution uh, for the entire state, and we've been very supportive of that process thus far. Mikowitz has wrote, written a bill. There was a, um, a petition from Charlie Baker and then also from Senator Lesser, uh, but we've been very supportive of uh, Mikowitz. Um, what's clear, critical about that is there are several local options that cities can can put up that requires a simple majority five votes. Amend the zoning takes six votes. That's right. That's right. And and taxation, that's another issue right. too. So anyway, we're out of time, so we'll see you next week on Cambridge Inside Out.